Did you ever wonder if the food you eat has a direct effect on your health, well-being, and longevity? Well, I'm here to end that mystery. You are the food you eat. Welcome to the Nutrition Facts Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Greger. Today we look at stents, those tiny tubes that doctors insert into a blocked artery to try to keep it open. Did you know that there's demonstrably little or no benefit to the hundreds of thousands of stent procedures performed outside of an emergency setting? Here's our first story. The large national cardiology conferences may attract the majority of cardiologists in the entire country in one place. So hey, if you're going to have a heart attack, that would seem to be the place to do it. And indeed, that's when the American Heart Association president had his within hours of his presidential address. With so many of the nation's top cardiologists at the conference, maybe that's a bad time to go into cardiac arrest anywhere else, though. You don't know until you put it to the test. To their surprise, they found substantially lower mortality among those going into cardiac failure or cardiac arrest during the big national cardiology meetings. Why is the death rate lower when most of the cardiologists are away? One potential explanation is that the intensity of care may be lower, suggesting the harms of such care may unexpectedly outweigh the benefits. Their results echo paradoxical findings documented during a labor strike by Israeli physicians, during which mortality rates evidently dramatically fell. And it wasn't just one strike. It has been looked at multiple times, and in all reported cases, mortality either stayed the same or decreased. In four of the seven cases, mortality dropped as a result of the strike, and in three, there was no significant change. The fact is that many current medical practices have been found to offer no benefit, and in fact, potential harms. Even physicians themselves estimate that about a fifth of medical care is unnecessary. A national summit was convened by the Joint Commission that accredits hospitals and the American Medical Association to identify areas of overuse, treatments that provide zero or negligible benefit, potentially exposing patients to a risk of harm for nothing. They called out five practices. For example, prescribing antibiotics for viral upper respiratory tract infections, spending a billion dollars prescribing drugs that don't work, and if anything, just make things worse. But another overuse practice they identified was elective percutaneous coronary intervention. In other words, angioplasty and stents. Just to get everyone on the same page before we dive in, coronary artery disease, the number one killer of men and women, involves blockages in the blood vessels that supply the heart muscle itself. Uh, Low blood flow can lead to a type of chest pain called angina, or if severe enough, uh, to a heart attack. Uh, Plant-based diets and lifestyle programs have been shown to reverse these blockages by treating the cause of why our arteries are clogging up in the first place. But for those unable or unwilling to change their diets, there are drugs that can help, as well as more invasive treatments such as open-heart surgery to try to bypass the blockage, or percutaneous coronary intervention. That's when doctors insert small balloons or metal tunnels called stents up through large blood vessels, typically in the groin, and thread them all the way up into the heart. That way, you can get inside the blocked vessels and try to open them up and prop them open. Now, during a heart attack, this can be life-saving. But hundreds of thousands of these procedures are done every year for stable angina, meaning on a non-emergency basis, which can relieve symptoms but doesn't actually reduce your risk of having or dying from a heart attack in the future. However, not everyone knows that. I mean, they mistakenly think the procedure offers more than just symptom relief. That's one of the reasons I'm doing this video series. As Harvard put it, stents are for pain, not protection. But then, unbelievably, it was discovered that stents may not even help with pain, as revealed in this double-blind, randomized controlled trial. Wait, you can blind people to the active treatment in drug trials by giving them a placebo sugar pill, but wouldn't you kind of notice if you got surgery or not, like whether or not they cut into your groin? Not if you got 
sham surgery, placebo surgery, where they cut into everyone, thread up the catheter, and at the last moment randomly actually do or do not actually place the actual stent. And those who got the fake surgery did just as well as those who got the regular surgery. Wait, there are no benefits to angioplasty and stents outside of an emergency setting? Doesn't prevent heart attacks? doesn't enable you to live longer, and doesn't even help with symptoms? And since the procedure carries some risks, including death, maybe stents should be used only by people who are actively having heart attacks. But wait, so hundreds of thousands of people are getting these operations for nothing? How do the doctors justify it? I mean, is it just greed? I mean, how do they get patients to sign up? Uh, do they just not tell them the truth? And wait, why doesn't it work? I mean, you are, after all, opening up a blocked artery. There's just so many questions, which we'll start addressing next. In our next story, we look at how most heart attacks are caused by non-obstructive plaques that infiltrate the entire coronary artery tree. Angioplasty, which is when a tiny balloon is inserted into a narrowed coronary artery feeding your heart to force it to open wider to improve blood flow, wasn't put to the test in a randomized controlled trial until 1992, and it failed to prevent heart attacks and failed to show any survival benefit, uh, but they only followed them out six months, and including people with relatively minor disease who maybe just weren't sick enough to benefit. Enter the MASS trial, enrolling those with severe blockages high up in their widowmaker artery or widower maker. Coronary artery disease is also the number one killer of women, and followed them out for years. And there was no difference in subsequent mortality or heart attacks. Okay, but there were only about 200 patients. Maybe the benefit was so subtle that you just needed a greater number of patients to tease out the effect. Enter the Rita 2 study, randomizing more than a thousand patients, and they did indeed get a clear difference in the risk of future death and heart attack, but it was in the wrong direction. The angioplasty group suffered twice the risk compared to those randomized to forego surgery. Okay, but that was all before stents came into vogue. Instead of just ballooning up the artery, how about permanently inserting a stent, a metal mesh tube, to prop the artery open? Uh, surely that's got to help. Which brings us to mass 2, and still no benefit. Okay, but that was after just one year. But still no benefit after five years or even ten years later. The COURAGE trial was the biggie, randomizing thousands of patients, and it fell flat on its face. Yes, but those were mostly bare metal stents, not the fancy new drug-eluting stents that slowly release drugs. And what about high-risk groups, those with you know diabetes, those with more serious disease, those with 100% blocked arteries days after a heart attack, and meta-analysis. After meta-analysis, five trials with 5,000 patients and no reduction in death, heart attack, or even angina pain. Ten trials with more than 6,000 patients and no benefit for survival, heart attacks, or pain relief. Now we're up to more than a dozen major trials and nothing, no benefit from angioplasty and stents. Uh, furthermore, multiple analyses have failed to identify a single high-risk subset with stable disease that benefits. How is that possible? I mean, you're physically opening up blood flow. The reason it doesn't work is because the majority of heart attacks in real life are caused by narrowings under 70%. So the plaques in your arteries that kill you tend not to be the ones that are restricting blood flow. Most heart attacks are caused by non-obstructive plaques that don't even cut blood flow 50%. There's this clogged pipe misconception that has been difficult to dislodge, you know, imagining that cholesterol plaques slowly, inexorably encroach on blood flow, eventually cutting it off, completely uh, triggering a heart attack. In reality, coronary artery disease is an inflammatory disease in which the cholesterol from the blood being deposited in the artery walls causes an inflammatory reaction like a pimple. And when those pimples pop, they cause the blood in the arteries to clot at the site. 
Before rupture, these plaques often do not limit flow and may be invisible to angiography and stress tests, therefore not amenable to angioplasty and stents. Old plaques are like old scarred pimples. Right? The tightest blockages are made up of mostly just calcified and dense fibrous scar tissue. They can still rupture and kill you, but there are so many more of the smaller lesions brewing which are hidden from view. The way we visualize coronary arteries is with an angiogram, where x-rays are taken, which inject this you know, black-looking dye into the arteries, uh, so we can only see plaques that encroach on the blood flow. That's why you get these kinds of tip of the iceberg illustrations, right? the point of which is to emphasize that most of the atherosclerotic plaque in the coronary arteries is not seen well by angiography. I mean, to really understand what's going on in people's arteries, we must turn to autopsy. William Clifford Roberts is probably the most preeminent cardiovascular pathologist in the world. What did he learn after studying coronary arteries for 50 years? After digging around in nearly 2,000 bodies, he learned that atherosclerosis is a systemic disease. In patients with fatal coronary artery disease, the quantity of plaque is enormous. There's not just one plaque here, another plaque there, with normal clean arteries in between. The plaques are continuous. Not a single 5 millimeter segment in the entire coronary artery tree is devoid of plaque. So isolated coronary disease is a myth. There's no such thing as one-vessel disease, two-vessel disease, left main disease. Plaque is in all of them if it's in one of them. Adding up the lengths of the four major coronary arteries to feed the heart, the right coronary artery, the, the left main, the circumflex, and the left anterior descending, uh, they add up to about 11 inches of coronary arteries, which for examination can be cut into about 50 quarter inch slices. And this is what you see, not plaque gunking up one or two slivers, but all throughout the coronary arteries. If you look at over a thousand of these slices from dozens of patients who died of heart attacks, not a single segment was devoid of plaque. So no wonder why just stenting open one area has no impact on heart attacks or death. We would love it if you could share with us your stories about reinventing your health through evidence-based nutrition. Go to nutritionfacts.org slash testimonials. We may share it on our social media to help inspire others. To see any graphs, charts, graphics, images, or studies mentioned here, please go to the Nutrition Facts podcast landing page. There you'll find all the detailed information you need, plus links to all the sources we cite for each of these topics. For a vital, timely text on the pathogens that cause pandemics, you can order the ebook, audiobook, or the hard copy of my second to latest book, How to Survive a Pandemic. For recipes, uh, check out my latest, the How Not to Diet Cookbook. It's beautifully designed with more than 100 recipes for delicious and nutritious meals. And of course, all proceeds I receive from the sales of my books go to charity. NutritionFacts.org is a nonprofit science based public service where you can sign up for free daily updates on the latest in nutrition research via bite sized videos and articles. Everything on the website is free. There's no ads, no corporate sponsorship. It's strictly non-commercial. I'm not selling anything. I just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother, whose own life was saved with evidence-based nutrition.